We're going to go back to 1 John. So if you'll start turning there, we're going to start where we left off when when we left to go on vacation and to uh, be with Nancy's folks and to uh, also see Mark graduate. So we're in 1 John and we're in chapter 2. And this morning we're going to be in verses 24 down through 26. Did you know that the average person in the United States of America, not the world, much more so in the rest of the world, but in the United States of America, the average person is exposed to millions of potentially life-damaging and even fatal germ-causing diseases in the course of a lifetime. Yet most of these diseases have relatively very little effect on most of us because of our body's immune system's ability to detect, fight off, and destroy the germs that try to get in and hurt or even kill us. Now because the human body does such a a good job of providing an environment for germs, I don't know if you realize that, but our bodies provide a great environment for germs in which to grow, Because it provides such an environment, germs are always trying to break in, always trying to get into our bodies, and it's the immune system's job to keep them out, or failing to keep them out, it's the immune system's job to seek them out and destroy them before they harm us. Our immune system enables us to function in the midst of an environment that is filled with potentially harmful and dangerous germs which are continually attacking our bodies. And the key to our immune system success is the ability to recognize foreign cells, which are called antigens, and then attack them once they invade the body, once they've been recognized as foreign cells. Now, did you know that you as a believer in Christ have a spiritual immune system? Did you know that? You also have a spiritual immune system that lives within you. It's an internal immune system that has the job of recognizing, detecting, and protecting you from spiritual germs, foreign objects spiritually that have no part in your body. Your spiritual immune system is made up of two living organisms. Now one you're already going to guess is going to be the Holy Spirit of God, the living Spirit of God. I don't know if you realize that the other is also a living organism, It's the living and sharp Word of God. Both of these live within us. And I'm going to show you that here in just a few minutes. And act as an immune system to protect us from false teaching. To protect us from false doctrine. But there is a part that we play in this whole immune system's battle against false teaching. It's how much we give ourselves to the Word of God and submit ourselves to the control of of the Spirit of God. Now, here in 1 John chapter 2, verses 24 through 26, we're going to be talking this morning about the, the first frontal attack that we have in our immune system, and that's going to be the Word of God. Next week we'll be talking about the Spirit of God. But what I want us to see when we look at both of these, the Spirit of God and the Word of God, is that the believer's primary means of defense against becoming deceived by false teaching is the indwelling Word of God and the indwelling Spirit of God. Now, John started this whole section on false teaching up in verse 18. And and let's look there. He said this, Children, it's the last hour. And just as you've heard that Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have appeared. From this we know that it's the last hour. Antichrists are those who are against Christ. That's all Antichrist means, against Christ. And here he is calling the false teachers that have come into the church, actually have come out of the church, really. He's going to tell us the next verse. He calls them antichrists because they're teaching doctrine that is against that which Christ has given us in his word. He says in verse 19, they went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us, but they went out so that it would be shown that they are all not of us. These false teachers came out of the church. They were in the church, but John makes it clear in verse 19 to say they were really not of the church. They were really not Christians. And we see that in verse 20 because he says this to them. He says, you have an anointing from the Holy One and you all know. In contrasting the the believers that stayed and are in the church saying that they have an anointing from the Holy One, he is saying that those who are the false teachers 
who were of us, who, who left us, did not have this same anointing. Then verse 21, he says, I've not written to you because you don't know the truth, but because you do know it, because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. These false teachers were denying either the deity or the humanity of Jesus Christ. And in denying who Jesus Christ is, in denying His true identity, they're taking away everything from salvation because you have to be saved by a Savior who is both truly God and truly man. And so to deny either one of those aspects of who Jesus Christ is is to destroy your salvation. He goes on, he says, verse 23, Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father. The one who confesses the Son has the Father also. And then he gets to verse 24. After he's talked about these false teachers, he gives the Christian some instructions regarding how do you protect yourself against false teaching. Now understand that John is presupposing here that you are going to encounter false teaching as a Christian. In fact, he is presupposing that you're going to hear false teaching even within the church of Christ, within the church of God. You are going to encounter those within the church who are not true Christians and who teaching false doctrine. Listen, for us to have the blinders on and not have a discerning spirit, even within our own church, is really not a good idea. Everything needs to be checked out by the Word of God because that is the standard by which we check everything out. So John is, is presupposing that we will encounter false teaching in our Christian experience. And he says in verse 24, As for you, talking to the believer, as for you, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. This is the promise which He Himself made to us eternal life. Now we're going to be talking, like I said, next two weeks about the indwelling Word of God and the indwelling Spirit of God. And the first point, the first principle I want us to see coming out of verses 24 and 25 is simply this. The indwelling Word of God provides us with the information we need to protect ourselves from false teaching. The indwelling Word of God provides us with information, with the information we need to protect ourselves from false teaching. Now what we're going to see next week is that the indwelling Spirit of God provides us with the illumination so that we can understand the information we're giving. Unbelievers don't have the illumination of the Holy Spirit. They don't have the Spirit of God indwelling them and helping them to understand the Word of God. We do as believers. And so God gives us two things. He gives us the information we need, and through the Spirit of God, He gives us the ability to understand and apply that information. Today we're going to be talking about the Word of God. It's the one that provides us with the information we need. And what we're going to see in these two verses is that the believer who immerses himself in the Word of God so that it abides in him, will also abide in the Father and in the Son. Now, he says in verse 24 again, it says, As for you, let that abide in you, which you heard from the beginning. What is the that? The that has taken us back over to, to chapter 1, verse 1, where he says, What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we've seen with our eyes, what we've looked at and touched with our hands, concerning the word of life, Jesus. And what John is saying here in verse 24 of chapter 2 is this. You need to let the gospel message abide in you. You don't need to be chasing another gospel, a false gospel. The gospel that you heard about Jesus Christ that declared Jesus Christ to be both God the Son, fully God and fully man, who went to the cross of Calvary, who died to pay for sins, who rose again the third day, and who is alive evermore at the Father's right hand, interceding for believers, that is the gospel that you need to hold on to. You need to hold on to the gospel that says you need to place your faith in Jesus Christ. You need to repent of your sins. And you need to embrace Jesus Christ as the only way of salvation. So what John is saying is if you hold on to that message and you don't waver from that message, that is what's going to assure you abiding fellowship with God. 
Now, by extension, John also is talking about the whole Word of God because the Gospel, and we saw this back when we started the study in John, the Gospel is about Christ. The Word of God is about Christ. If you understand the Bible correctly, it's presenting Jesus Christ. The Old Testament is presenting Christ who is going to come to be the Savior. The New Testament is talking about Christ who has come and the ramifications of that. So what John is really saying in verse 24 is this, is if we want to protect ourselves from false teaching and we want to have fellowship with God that is abiding and is all that God wants us to have, then we need to be immersing ourselves in the Word of God. We need to be abiding in the Word of God so that the Word of God is abiding in us. Now the word abide in Greek simply means to remain, to remain, to live in, to dwell in, so as to influence in a positive way. In other words, if I were to ask you to come live in my home, and you come into my home and I say, listen, I want you to make yourself comfortable in my home. The refrigerator, you open it up anytime you're hungry. Uh, if you want to go to the bathroom, here's the bathroom. You use it anytime you want. Here's the couch. You lay on the couch anytime you want. Here's the remote control. Anytime you want to watch TV, you turn on the TV. You, you just live in my home, and my home is your home. That's what the word abide means. And so what John is saying is that we need to let the Word of God live comfortably in our lives. In other words, there are no closed rooms. There are no rooms that you've got the door closed and you say, Word of God, you can live in my life, but don't go into that room. That one is off limits. Now, maybe in all of your homes, you have certain rooms that are off limits to guests. And you, when guests come over, what do you do? You just simply close those doors and you would assume that any honorable guest would not open up that door and go in there and start snooping around. Don't you ever wonder, when you have people over from church, do they go into the medicine cabinet? Did they do that? So do you ever move things around in certain ways? You know, say, I'll find out if they did or not. Or like ex-cops, do you ever dust the handles for print prints? <laughs> Uh-huh. No. Well, you know, there are certain things that are, that are off limits. Well, the word abide means that you let this into your home, your life, and nothing is off limits. There are no closed doors. There's no closets that are locked. There's no cabinets that it can't have access to. You let it in, and it has free access to go and do and operate freely within your life. And so he says this, As for you, let that, again, the Gospel, the Word of God, have free access in your life. Let it go wherever it wants. Let it convict you of any area that it desires to. And then he says, If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, if it lives in you in this way, look what the promise is, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. I often find that sometimes when we are not experiencing the joy of fellowship with God as fully as we should, it's because we are not allowing the Word of God to have the full access that it should in our lives. In other words, we are holding certain areas of our life away from the spotlight of God's Word, and that will always affect your experience of fellowship with God Himself because God and His Word are one and the same. Do you know that the Word of God is as authoritative as God Himself? It has to be or it's not the Word of God. And so to say to the Word of God, I don't want you touching this area of my life is the same thing to say to God, God, I don't want you messing in this area of my life. And so what John is saying to these Christians, and again, understand, this is in the whole context of protection from false teaching, you have got to be immersing yourself in the Word of God so that it's abiding in you comfortably, going wherever it wishes, convicting you of whatever it needs to, so that you can enjoy fellowship with God and with His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, look at verse 25. It says, This is the promise which He Himself made to us, eternal life. In the Greek text, the word chi begins this sentence. The word chi means and. Why the translators didn't insert and, I don't know, but here's how it should read. And this is the promise which He Himself made to us, eternal life. What is the promise He made to Himself, eternal life? Fellowship with God and with His Son. Eternal life, we get so caught up on this and we've talked about it many times, is not heaven. Heaven is where we will enjoy 
eternal life unhindered. But did you know that if you're a believer, you are experiencing or should be experiencing and enjoying eternal life right now? Look at John 17, verse 3. John 17, verse 3. This is Jesus' definition of eternal life. John 17, 3. Jesus said this. He's praying to His Father. Verse 1, Jesus spoke these things and lifting up His eyes to heaven, He said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify Your Son that the Son may glorify You. Even as You gave Him authority over all flesh, that to all whom You have given Him He may give eternal life. Verse 3, this is eternal life, that they may know You, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom You have sent. The word know is gnosko, it's to experience God. And so Jesus says eternal life is to experience God, to know God, to relate to God. And so in 1 John, the same writer, John, is saying this, is if the Word of God is abiding in you, because you are abiding in the Word of God, then you are abiding in the Father and in the Son, and this is eternal life. Now, some of you are saying... Boy, that's not so exciting. Some of you honestly are saying, oh, that's it? That's eternal life? I mean, my Bible reading and my prayer time and my walk with the Lord is eternal life. Don't let your experience of perhaps not enjoying God as fully as you could diminish the definition of eternal life. Don't let your experience or my experience of not abiding in the Word of God so that the Word of God is abiding in us so that we are enjoying fellowship with God cause you in any way, shape, or form to diminish what God says eternal life is. The problem is not what eternal life is. The problem is your experience of eternal life. And what John is saying here is that your experience and my experience of eternal life will always be tied back to whether the Word of God is abiding in your heart and life or not. Because God has given us His Word, has spoken His Word to us, and He says, if you abide in this, you will abide in Me. And this is the promise which I've made to you eternal life. Now here's part of the problem. This is why heaven is so appealing And heaven is very appealing. The older we get, the more appealing heaven gets, right? Eternal life in heaven is appealing because sin will not be in heaven. That which limits us in our experience of God and in our enjoyment of God is our own sin. When you go to heaven, there is no sin to limit you. And so, yes, you will experience eternal life beyond degree, much greater than you could ever experience right now. But that still doesn't do away with the promise that God's given to you and I while we're on earth that if we will abide in the Word of God, the Word of God will abide in us. We will abide in the Father and the Son and this is eternal life. Now, here's where the false teaching comes in. False teachers are successful only because they have convinced Christians that there is something more to the Christian life than this. That is the only reason why false teachers exist and continue to exist is because Christians fall for a promise that there is something more. And so they give their offering, they send their checks into the TV, and they buy into there's got to be something more than what God has provided to us in His Word already. And what God is saying here in verse 25, this is the promise which He Himself made to us, eternal life. He says, this is on earth as good as it gets. The problem if you're not experiencing God to the fullest as you should and as you desire is not because the Word of God is not powerful, it's because we still have sin issues that we're dealing with and perhaps rooms in our house that we're not allowing the Word of God to have access to. And that's where the problem lies. You know, false teaching, and John knew this, this is why he's talking to these people. You know, envision John talking to his church, his, his people, as you would a father or a mother who's about to send a child off to, a, to college or the military, and you're concerned about what they're going to hear, and you don't want them to fall for false teaching, and you know everything out there under the sun is going to be 
place before them. And so you sit them down one day and you say, listen, I've got to talk to you. I want to give you some advice. I want to share some things with you. That's what John's doing here. And he says, here's your number one defense against false teaching. Get into this book. Abide in this book. So that this book abides in you. And if this is abiding in you, if this is remaining in you, if it's living comfortably in you, if you're obeying this, you're going to abide in fellowship with the Father and the Son and no false teacher is going to be able to persuade you that there's anything better than that. Because there's not anything better than that. And if you find yourself being thinking and starting to wander off false teaching or promises that come from from those who do not know the Lord, it's because your relationship with the Lord is not what it ought to be. Because you're not allowing the Word of God to abide in you, to dwell comfortably in you. False teachers and false teaching that take anyone away from the Word of God cannot deliver, cannot deliver to you more of an experience with God than is already available to you in and through the Word of God. They can't. There is no experience available to the Christian that God has not already promised to you if you will get into His Word. Now next we're going to talk about the Spirit of God's role in all this. Because again, you've got an immune system, a spiritual immune system, that's made up of two living organisms, the living Word of God and the living Spirit of God. Now we're not going to have time to talk about how those two gel today, so we're going to spend time on the Word of God. The Spirit of God is involved here too. But anyone that promises you more than the Word of God promises you and more than the Spirit of God promises to do in you can't deliver on that promise because there is no such thing. So the believer who immerses himself in the Word of God knows what God has promised and he's not going to be easy prey for false teachers. Now, here's, here's something we do need to talk about. God has promised the believer eternal life, which is the operating to know God, to love God, to pursue God, to possess and thoroughly enjoy God as His greatest treasure and pleasure in life, from which all joy proceeds. But in this promise, God has also promised that one day, one day, we're going to be given a brand new body. And that this brand new body is going to be free from disease. There's not going to be any more tears, no more sickness. We're not going to be injured. There's not going to be persecution. There's not going to be disappointment. There's not going to be discouragement. And much of the false teaching that goes on today is simply telling Christians, you can have that now. You can have that kind of eternal life right now. And I'm going to tell you, you can't have that right now. And here's the reason why you can't have it right now. Because there is sin right now. And all those things are the result of sin. Go with me to Isaiah 53. You will get that one day, but you're not going to get it until sin is removed. When you go to heaven, you receive a new body. Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 is talking about Christ who is going to come and go to the cross and pay the price for sin. Verse 4, Surely our griefs He Himself bore and our sorrows He carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed Him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. Okay, Remember, Jesus went to the cross. In Acts we're told that the Father delivered Him to the cross. People were asking, who's guilty of crucifying Jesus? And God says, I delivered Him to the cross of Calvary. If you want to know who did it, I did. Because the only way that your sins could be forgiven is for me to take Him to the cross so that your sins could be paid for. So that's why it says, smitten of God and afflicted. Look at verse 5. But He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon Him. Are we talking about disease or are we talking about sin? Did He die to pay for our diseases or to pay for our sins? We're talking about sin. This whole context is talking about sin. And then it comes to the next part of verse 5, and by His scourging we are healed. A lot of false teachers will take off on that and they'll say, see, by His scourging we've been healed, therefore we should have no sickness, we should have no disease, and if you're really right with God, you're not going to have any of those things because here's the promise, guys. That healing is healing from sin. Healing from sin. God says, I'm going to take care of your sin problem. Because that's the real problem. That's the real issue that you're dealing with here. The whole context of Isaiah 53 is not dealing with being healed of our diseases. 
It's talking about being healed of our sin problem, our sin struggles. Now, is there a point in time where we are healed of our diseases and we have these new bodies? Yes, there is. But the false teachers will come along and they'll tell you, you can have this stuff now. And the Bible says, no, it's later. And again, if you fall for that, you're falling for a false gospel. And you've got to be careful of that. Look with me over at Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Look at Philippians 3. Look at verse 20 through 21. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of His glory by the exertion of the power that He has even to subject all things to Himself. One day you're going to receive a new body and you are going to be like Christ. And at that point is when the rest of the promise comes due. But not yet. Not yet. Go back to 1 John. Look at 1 John chapter 3. We'll be dealing with this in just a couple of weeks. Look at 1 John 3, verse 2. Beloved, now we are children of God. So I want you to know that right now, if you place faith in Jesus Christ, if He's your Lord and Savior, right now, you are a child of God. You don't have to wait for that. That's your possession right now. That's your position right now. And it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We don't know really all that we're going to be when, when we get to heaven. But look what he says. We know that when He appears... We will be like Him because we will see Him just as He is. We will be like Him in glorified bodies, free from disease, free from sickness, and all those things. But not yet. It's still to come. It's still to come. The Word of God tells us that the greatest blessing and joy we can experience is knowing God. Pursuing God is our greatest treasure and pleasure in life. It supersedes all other blessings. And, and if you're sitting there and you're saying, oh man, come on, you, don't, you haven't lived if that's what you think. No, you haven't lived. You don't know what life is until you experience joy of God because you are abiding in Him. And the only way you can do that is by abiding in the Word of God. And that's what John is saying. That's what John wants us to know. Now, how does the Word of God abide in us? Let me give you three, three principles. Number one, you've got to internalize the Word of God. How does the Word of God abide in you so that you abide in the Father and in the Son? Number one, you've got to internalize the Word of God. Internalizing the Word of God means you read it, you study it, meditate on it, you memorize it, you take it in. You've got to internalize it. The second thing you have to do, you have to personalize it. You know, when I read the Word of God, I don't read the Word of God, believe it or not, I don't read the Word of God to come up with a message. That's not how I read the Word of God. That's not even how I study the Word of God. I study the Word of God to know what it says. And out of that comes the message. And I always, after internalizing it, I personalize it. I take the passage and I say, okay, what does this say to Mark Waite? How does Mark Waite apply this? I don't ever come to this Try not to. I am tempted sometimes. I'll be honest. I am tempted sometimes to say, yeah, what's does Scott Butler do with this? What should Dwayne Mallett do with it? No, no. I, you know, I, I try not to do that. And I try to look at the Word of God and I say, okay, Lord, what does Mark Waite need to do with this? And one of the ways that I have found that helps me to personalize the Word of God is after I have studied it and applied everything to me, I pray the passage. I go to the passage and I say, Lord, you've got to help me abide in your word so that I can abide in you. And I personalize that to my own life. And then the third thing you do if you're going to abide in the word of God is you've got to harmonize the word. That's not harmonizing the word with your life. It's harmonizing your life with the word of God. In other words, you've got to apply it. You've got to put it to work. So you've got to internalize it, you personalize it, and you harmonize it. Now let's look at verse 26. And this will be the last one we'll look at today. John says this. He says, okay, number one, you need to abide in the Word of God if you're going to defend yourself against false teaching. And then verse 26, he says, these things I have written to you concerning those who are trying to deceive you. These things. The things that John wrote is Scripture. Inspired Scripture. So he says, listen, 
recognize that the things I've written to you, in fact, all of the Word of God has been written to you to help you with those who are trying to deceive you. John has has given us many descriptions of false teachers, and the first one that he's given us is that a false teacher is going to be teaching false doctrine. And here's something that we all need to understand. The test of authenticity, the test of whether a preacher or a teacher is genuine or not, has nothing to do with the miracles that they can do. It has nothing to do with the signs that they're able to perform has nothing to do with the spiritual gifts that they profess to have. The true test of whether one is an authentic and genuine teacher of God is whether or not what they teach is the Word of God. Whether what they teach is in accord with the Word of God, not only in accord with the Word of God, but from the Word of God. That's the test of authenticity for anyone who says that they're a teacher of God's Word. Is it coming from the Word of God? And is it the Word of God? That's the test. Not what you can do, not not what you say you can do, not what great miracles you may have done. And and John goes on and he tells us, here's, here's a list for you, here's a criteria by which you can measure a false teacher. He said, number one, realize this, in chapter 2, verse 18, they're going to increase in number as the end times, end times approach. As the, as the church moves forward, more false teachers are going to show up. Where there's light, there's what? Bugs, right? Every time I turn my front light on, I get bugs. Where there's light, there will always be bugs. You find yourself a good Bible-believing church and you don't think there's going to be bugs, you are sadly mistaken. Where there are light, there's bugs. Number two, they're going to have an affiliation with the church. Chapter 2, verse 19, they were in the church. Now, you don't got to worry so much about the... the um, the, the atheists and the agnostics out there, which is what our tendency is, you need to worry about those people who look like good Christians who are teaching false doctrine. Number three, they're not true believers. Chapter 2, verses 19 and 20. Number four, they're not concerned with the truth. Chapter 2, verse 21. They deny and pervert fundamental doctrines of the Christian faith. Chapter 2, verse 22. They don't have a relationship with God the Father. Chapter 2, verse 23. And they purposely try to deceive believers to lead them away from the truth of God's Word. Look at verse 26 again, because I want you to see something here. So many times we tend to think of everybody as being good. Yeah, everybody's good. We, we really struggle sometimes with this whole doctrine of the depravity of man. We don't think, really, you know, they can't be trying to deceive us. They're just sadly mistaken. I want you to look at verse 26. These things I have written to you concerning those who are trying to deceive you. These aren't guys who are making mistakes in their teaching. These are people who are trying, purposely trying to deceive Christians. You know, just because a teacher makes a mistake, and and if you've ever taught the Word of God, and you can say, honestly, I have never made a mistake... I don't think you're very honest. Because that would mean that you've got a handle on this book that certainly is above everybody else. I I, I can look back at messages that I wish I had never, ever preached before. I can think back of things that I have said and say, oh my word, how in the world did that come out? Well, everyone who has ever taught the Word of God that I know would admit to saying, you know what, I have made some mistakes. Does that make you a false teacher? No, it doesn't. You may have taught something falsely, but it doesn't make you a false teacher. A false teacher is one, verse 26, who is trying to deceive you. They are purposely neglecting the truth. They are purposely perverting the truth. Or maybe they are just sugarcoating the truth in an attempt to cause you to be deceived. That's a false teacher. Just because you make a mistake doesn't mean... You're a false teacher. You may have some repenting to do, some more study to do, some work to do, some talking to do with the Lord. doesn't mean you're a false teacher. Now, why does Satan want false teachers to rise up? And understand this. False teachers have very little to do with unbelievers. They're not trying to deceive unbelievers. They're trying to deceive believers. And there's, there's three reasons that Satan uses false teachers to try and deceive believers. By the way, the word deceive is 
the word or trying to deceive is the word where we get our word planet. It means to wander in circles. In other words, what they try to do is get you to wander in circles. They're not trying to, to necessarily cause you to, to leave the Christian faith. They just want you to wander. Never come to the truth. Just wander around searching for the truth, but never ever come to the truth. And the reason why Satan wants to do that, and there's threefold. Number one is this. Satan wants you to wander in your Christian experience because he wants to limit your potential for experiencing God's grace and peace in your life. Look over at 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, Peter writes this. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours, by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. And look at verse 2. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Okay, how do you have grace and peace multiplied to you? It comes in the knowledge of God and Jesus. And where do we get the knowledge of God and Jesus? From this book. And so Satan wants to move you away from this book. He doesn't want you to abide in this book because if he can get you to wander outside of this book, the Word of God, he limits your potential to experience God's grace and God's peace in your life. That doesn't mean that you don't have God's grace, but you're not experiencing it. Have you ever in your Christian life found yourself not experiencing God's grace and God's peace? You're just whacked out. Just like the unbeliever is, you're pursuing everything the unbeliever is pursuing. You're, you're worried. You're struggling. You're trying to climb the ladder. God's grace and peace seem to have very little impact or effect upon your life. I bet you that if you looked, you would also find that you're spending very little time in this book. I bet you're not abiding in the Word of God. Because as long as we abide in the Word of God and grow in our knowledge of God and Jesus, that grace and peace are experienced in our lives. Here's the second thing that Satan wants to do and why he brings false teachers into a Christian's experience. He wants to cut you off from your divine power source so as to limit your potential for living godly. He wants to limit your power. Look over at 2 Peter 1.3. Look at the next verse. 2 Peter 1.3. Seeing that His divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness... Through what? The true knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and excellence. He said God's given you and I divine power to live the Christian life and do everything that God wants us to do. But that divine power is accessed through the true knowledge of God. And so if you're not growing in your knowledge of God, you have this power, but you can't access it. You're like the guy who goes to the ATM machine like I did a while back who forgot his pin code. I'll try this one. Do you know how many combinations of four numbers there are in this world? And do you know how many times the machine will let you try them before it says, you better move on to another machine or, you know, you're in trouble. We're, gonna take, we're not going to give your card back. Uh, no, that doesn't work. Well, I've got money in the bank. I really do. It's there. It's my money. I put it there. I can't access the money because I don't know how to access it. You as a Christian have divine power, all the power you need to live the Christian life. You can't access it unless you're abiding in the Word of God. That's the pin code. Doesn't do you much good if you can't access it, does it? Finally, Satan wants to limit one other thing that you should experience as a Christian. And that's joy. If you look over 1 John chapter 1, back in our passage, 1 John chapter 1. Satan wants to interrupt your fellowship with the Lord so as to rob you of your joy. The joy that only comes through uninterrupted fellowship with God. Look at 1 John 1, 3 and 4. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you. This is the message about Jesus, the Gospel, the Word of God. So that you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. He says, listen, you need to be in the Word of God so that you can enjoy the same kind of fellowship we're enjoying with God the Father. And look at verse 4. These things we write so that our joy may be made complete. Our joy as Christians 
is the direct result of our fellowship with God. If you don't have joy as a Christian, it's because you're not fellowshipping with God. It's that simple. If you're fellowshipping with God, if you're abiding in God, you're going to have joy and it's going to overflow regardless of the situation you're in. But you can only be abiding in God if you are abiding in the Word of God. And so Satan wants to move you away from the Word of God so that he can rob you of your joy. Now, look back with me at Nehemiah chapter 8. Nehemiah chapter 8. Why is this so important? Look what Nehemiah 8 says. Nehemiah 8. The walls have have been rebuilt. There's a revival going on. Ezra has come to read the law to the people. They have not heard God's law read forever since they went into captivity. And so he's reading them the law. It's being translated into the language they now understand so the people can understand God's Word. And look what it says in verse 8, Nehemiah 8. They read from the book, from the law of God, translating to give the sense so they understood the reading, so they could understand God's Word. Then Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest, and the scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people were weeping when they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go, eat of the fat, drink of the sweet, send portions to him as nothing prepared for this, for this day is holy to our Lord. Do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites calmed all the people, saying, Be still, for the day is holy. Do not be grieved. All the people went away to eat, to drink, to send portions, and to celebrate a great festival because they understood the words which had been made known to them. Do you see the connection between understanding God's Word and experiencing God's joy? You see, when they could hear the Word of God taught and they understood it, That was fellowship with God and that gave them joy. And what Nehemiah says is this, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Do you know how you get through sickness? Do you know how you get through the flu? Do you know how you get through disease in your family? How you get through suffering? How you get through hard times? How you get through problems with your kids or problems with your parents? Do you know how you get through everything that bombards you in your life? It's by the joy of the Lord being your strength or you're not going to get through it very well. And so Nehemiah says this, don't be grieved. Don't let life grieve you. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Satan knows that and so should we. And so Satan wants to move us away from the Word of God so that we can't experience God's joy in our Lord, in our lives. Now one last thing I want to say on that and it's simply this. Look at verse 10 again. It says, For the joy of the Lord is is your strength. Now, thinking about that, go back to 1 John chapter 1, and we'll finish with this. It's your strength. Verse 4 of 1 John 1, these things we write so that our joy may be made complete. What I want you to understand is this. The joy that God promises us when we abide in His Word, we fellowship with Him, is not just some generic joy. He's not just saying, hey, listen, you can have joy. What He's saying is this, the joy that I experience as God. The joy that I experience in My Son, Jesus Christ. The joy that I experience being the almighty triune God of the universe can be your joy. It's not some generic joy that that I made for you. You can have my joy if you will fellowship with me by abiding in my word. Now let me say, I don't know that any of us on earth have probably ever experienced it to the degree that we could because it would transform our lives completely to have the joy of the Lord in our hearts. I think we come close sometimes. Sometimes I think we come closest in our greatest time of suffering. But I don't know that any of us have ever experienced it as fully as we could on earth. And the promise of the Word of God is this. You don't need to go out searching for false teaching to find something 
extra. All you need is right here. Abide in the Word of God. You will abide in Me. You will have My grace. You will have My peace. You will have My power. And you'll have My joy. And what more could you want this side of heaven? You know, in order to understand the body's immune system, all you have to do is look at what happens to anything once it dies. You see, when something dies, the immune system shuts down, and in a matter of hours, the body is invaded by all kinds of bacteria and microbes and parasites. You've all seen a dead dog or a dead animal, and you've seen all those things growing in it and coming out of it. That's because the immune system died. There's nothing to stop anything from going in, and what was in there is now going to thrive. There's nothing to fight it anymore. You know, the same is is true with us as Christians. Just as a human body can be dismantled in hours and days once the immune system is broken down by all kinds of parasites and everything else, your spiritual life, if you're not abiding in the Word of God, and you're not abiding in fellowship with God, your immune system breaks down, and it's amazing what can happen in your life. Amazing what can you can fall for. Amazing what kind of sins you could enter into that you may not have ever thought of entering into before. Amazing the kinds of attitudes that could come in and raise havoc in your life that you may have never let before, all because you now are not abiding in the Word of God. If you don't abide in the Word of God, you're not abiding in God. And all kinds of bad spiritual things can happen to people that don't do that. So let me ask you as I ask myself, are you internalizing the Word of God? Are you spending time in the Word of God, reading it and studying it and meditating upon it, memorizing it? Do you make it a point to place yourself under biblical teaching on a weekly basis? Are you personalizing the Word of God? Are you asking God, God, you show me what I need to know and praying about what you're studying? And finally, are you living your life in harmony with the Word of God? If you do those three things and you're abiding in the Word of God and the Word of God's abiding in you and you're going to enjoy fellowship with God. If the Word of God is not abiding in you, just look over at 1 John chapter 2, verse 14. And we'll close with this one verse. I have written to you, fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. If the word of God does not abide in you, then you are not strong. You will not overcome the evil one and you will fail greatly in your Christian experience. The Word of God. We need to immerse ourselves in it that it might abide in us, that we might experience the fellowship that God desires us to experience as believers. And I can't think of a single man or woman in all of church history whom God has used in a mighty way and who overcame Satan I can't think of a single one who did not immerse themselves in the Word of God. Can you? Can you think of any great saint who did great things for God who did not immerse themselves in the Word of God? Do you think you're going to be the exception? Let's pray. Father, thank You for Your Word and I pray that You would cause us to recognize even as simple as the message is that we must be in the Word. We must immerse ourselves in it. We must allow it to abide in us that it might have access to every room in our lives, every closet, every nook and cranny. We need to open up and allow the Word of God to go into every area of our life and convict us, challenge us, teach us, encourage us. And I pray that we would continue to grow as a church that abides in You as we abide in Your Word. And we'll thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.